Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, it's a very interesting film uh, for multiple reasons. I'm going to start with the most obvious one, which is the animation itself. Um, the animation is incredible uh, because it is so risk, uh, risk-taking. risk most animation, most mainstream animation is very risk averse, very safe, very safe, uh, very standard, nothing outside of the norm. Uh, Disney, even Pixar to this point, even though Pixar is uh, perfection as far as animation goes, they have a house style, which is conformity. Uh, we're going to see the same house style over and over again with slight variations here and there, but it is still the same basic, uh, predictable style that we've been seeing for the last few decades now. This is different. There's a lot of cross-pollination with anime, manga, uh, a lot of cross-pollination with some of the printed uh, comics for the last probably 30 years. Uh, I'll go into that more later, but I, I love the fact that it's a very subversive uh, postmodernist take on Spider-Man. Uh, and it sort of has to be because of what they're doing uh, with the IP. And I'll talk about that later, too. But just to give an overview of the film itself, I love the fact that they have integrated uh, everything together in terms of the, uh, the, the Spider-Verse itself and the Miles Morales character, who is the centerpiece of this, uh, which is very nice because Miles was the, the first, uh, first real established part of the Spider-Verse. And I love the fact that they have made him the centerpiece of this excursion into uh, the multiverse via Spider-Man. This film is, as I said, a continuation of the first film, which was very good, but was pretty much a remix reinterpretation of the Spider-Man mythos with the death of uh, the uncle, uh, the call to the call to heroism. Or the call to the call to adventure from the hero, going back to the Joseph Campbell legends uh, theory, and, and and Gilgamesh and everything else. It's a, it's a basic storyline. Um, the hero is called to be a hero. Uh, Miles Morales is a, a normal person, like Peter Parker, uh, who is uh, gifted with the ability to be a hero, but he is already heroic person before it happens uh, very much like the Captain America mythos where it's not Captain America, it's not the super soldier formula, it's not the Captain America mantle it is the actual persona of Steve Rogers that is the important aspect of it and here is Peter Parker and in this case Miles Morales the character of the individual who is in the costume who is given the mantle that is the important thing, not the mantle itself um, this animation, this film is very interesting in terms of what it's doing with that because here we see the reinterpretation of the call to, to adventure the, the idea that it was not something that was happening at random but something that was a chosen thing in the universe something that has to happen so the ideal of destiny the ideal of, um, of the universe making decisions for you uh, very much not a, a universe where you have free will, but one that has uh, predestination. Playing with that idea, I thought was very interesting, and they do it very well here, because there's a there's a an actual conflict amongst the characters. Should predestination be something that we acquiesce to, or should we seek free will? Uh, the characters themselves fight this, not just externally, but internally. You can see the internal fight amongst them about should we be acquiescing, should we give in to the ideal of this predetermination or should we fight against it even if it is something we can't win. And that is very much a Peter Parker, Spider-Man trope, the ideal of fighting against all odds for the thing that is correct. It's a Marvel trope, it's a Stan Lee trope. And here it's more expanded upon, which is nice uh, because I think that's something that when I was young, I really identify with the ideal of fighting against uh, fighting against conformity, fighting against ideals that people have pushed upon you, uh, fighting for your own identity, uh, your own definition of self. And we see that not just with Miles Morales, we see it also with Gwen Stacy uh, in her relationship with her father 
and the world in general. She's a, she's a young woman trying to find herself. She's a young woman who is trying to define herself. And she sees that mirrored in Miles, but in Miles, she sees it in a more complete way. Miles has his parents, uh, both of his parents. Uh, she has lost her parents and partially because she's accepted the call to adventure. And she was seeking Miles out, not only because she had to, if you see the movie, I won't spoil it for you, but she has to, but she also wants to because of the connection, the, the familiarity, the friendship, and perhaps even more than that, a connection that is deeper. And, and I'll go into that too, because there are some interesting aspects of that. But going back to what I said before about the ideal of the, the Spider-Verse and the multiple iterations of Spider-Man and the multiple analogous Spider-Mans across the multiverse. Um, I can't talk about this without talking about corporate idea ideologies. Um, Spider-Man is very much a brand like Coca-Cola uh, and like Coca-Cola, the brand has to expand brands like all things in capitalism and, and any other, any other uh, ideology has to expand. It has to grow. It can't maintain itself. Peter Parker has been the predominant Spider-Man for decades. And in order to expand that brand, you have to create different uh, flavors, different textures, different uh, conduits to get to people. The uniform, the costume of Spider-Man is, is a is a international brand and in order to expand it you have to expand peter parker out to these other characters in this film we see uh an east indian peter park uh, peter parker spider-man slash um and of course gwen stacy is the a, a white female equivalent to peter parker um miles morales of course being the the uh afro latino peter parker and we get many others here presented because you have to everyone has to identify in the first film there's a, a telling statement from Stan Lee's uh, animated uh, uh, character when he says uh, the suit fit always fits you know or anyone can wear the suit that concept of anyone can be Spider-Man anyone can wear the suit is a universality that didn't exist before but has to exist now if we're going to if, if the if the corporation is going to sell this image to the world, it has to be it, it's universal for everyone. Um, and there's a lot of backlash against that because there are people who are uh, conditioned by the conformity of Peter Parker being Peter Parker, being a, a brand that was specifically aimed towards a certain demographic and now is expanded out to everyone else. That gift is given to everyone else. That imagery is given to everyone else because it has to be in order to uh, continue the brand on the IP has to live now I don't want to get too deeply in, too deep into that I think I've gotten deep enough into it the ideal of branding and the IPs and the things like that I just wanted it out there because I, I noticed no one's talking about it and it needs to be spoken about going back to this product though the idea behind it being um, subversive because it is the creators of this cartoon they know what's going on and there's a lot of subversion within that. If you look at some of the imagery, you know, some of the ticks and nuances in the background, of course, it's designed for multiple viewings. And this thing will, I give, I, I tell you, will give you a great amount of uh, enjoyment or content or uh, it will give you a great amount of understanding if you look at it again. I've, I've only had the opportunity to see it once and fully, but I noticed there were many, many very subtle and very subversive things in here. I, I noticed that a lot of people like the uh, 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 the uh, Spider Punk, Hobie Brown, I believe his name is, uh, and he's he is he is the overtly subversive element in here, and he says a lot of things and he does a lot of things that are very oh obviously subversive. You know, even the idea that he's a punk. Spider Punk, you know, and he has all the punk paraphernalia of a Sex Pistols, you know, uh, musician from back in the day. He's actually a musician, um, and even the style in which he's animated is more uh, two dimensional, uh, like he's straight rip, ripped straight out of the comics page. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, of iconography in the character that is very subversive, as the character should be. 
Um, but some of that, I think, is the animators. And I think you probably had teams of animators in different countries putting things in there that they wanted in there. It looks like it. Even with Miles, I mean, if you look at his book, uh, his book bag, when he goes to his meeting with his counselor, uh, there's a BLM sticker and there are other stickers on there as well. And there's a lot of that within here. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, a very, um, I, I call it the remix, is where we're going to now because society is changing. We're no longer going to have a, a bipolar society. I call it bipolar. I know that's not the right way to use the word, but I call it bipolarity because we've always had a, 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 a world that was white and then other. And I think that bipolarity is no longer going to exist. We're moving into a world that is going to be much more uh, multilateral. Um, the the in, the East Indian uh, Spider-Man, for instance, there were a great a great there was a great deal of cultural uh, iconography in there and a great deal of cultural meaning within it, just in terms of how the character spoke and how the references that he made, the jokes that he made. You're going to see more and more of that. The Gwen Stacy character and how she interacts with her father and how her character is expressed, the emotionality of her character. She has certain emotional beats that only a, uh, I'm going to say it, only a white Western woman would have. Um, the way that she addressed her father in terms of the, 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 the conflict that she had with him and what she expected of him and why he, he wasn't giving it and she wanted that to happen. Some of that's universal, but the way that it was shaped was very much you know, a, a that of a of a white Western woman. I mean, I know people are going to be upset with me saying that, but it's the truth. Um, just as the arguments that Miles was having with his parents were very much culturally centered, the way that his mother addressed him, you know, the way that she interacted with him was very much culturally centered. Um, the way that even uh, uh, Peter B. Parker was reacting. It was very much culturally centered in terms of being a white male uh, father, new father, uh, interacting with his, um, like he said, his his mentee, as he called him, because he had a he had projected his fatherhood onto Miles, and having his own actual child was a way of actually fomenting that. Like, okay, yes, I have an actual child now that I can actually parent. You know, in addition to what I started doing with Miles, I can finish doing that with my actual biological child. Um, once again, this is a very interesting take on the spider mythos because Spider-Man Peter Parker, quote unquote, the original Spider-Man. Um, he very much was about trying to grow and figure out what was going on because he was fatherless and he was fatherless twice. He had lost his actual father and then lost his uncle Ben, who was his surrogate father. So he was orphaned twice. Um, and once again, that's one of the things with Spider-Man is the, the carrying on of tragedy, the carrying on of loss, very much a, a cornerstone of Spider-Man. One reason why I didn't like it when I was young was because of that. It was way too much. Uh, There's way too much of it that was on the nose, way too much of it that was too real for me. I read comments for escapism and the idea that Spider-Man uh, had no money, you know, he had girl problems, he had parent problems, or at least Aunt May problems, which is Aunt, which is his, uh, his, uh, his caretaker, um, his guardian. He had all of these problems. School, once he was trying to juggle being a superhero with school, he had problems with that. And he couldn't pay his rent once he moved out. I mean, there were all these issues, which made him very, very uh, real and very, very uh, easy to... Uh, relate to but it also took away some of the fantasy as far as I was concerned and here we're having the same thing with me that's my personal thing but I understand it in terms of the art I respect it in terms of the art and I enjoy that and as I said this film was a surprise to me I didn't think they could do the hat trick twice the first one the remix of his origin very well done uh, very emotionally driven this one was less so because now we have a Miles Morales who, and I love the fact that the, the, the animators have grown, have drawn him as a more mature young man. He was a child in the first movie. In this one, he is a young man. And you see it in his stature, in his build. Uh, and, and other characters mention it. They mention, oh, wait a minute, you, you've gotten taller. You know, you've gotten bigger. Yes, you know, I've grown. Uh, I'm more of a man now. He doesn't state that, but other characters keep 
referencing him as a child. He has to correct them on several occasions to say, no, 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 no. I am I am not a kid anymore. I am not that child that you met before. I have my own mind. I'm my own person. So we're seeing him grow, which is interesting because typically in sequels of films, we don't see characters make actual growth. Part of the way that commercial uh, cinema works is that we maintain it. Think of the Fast and Furious films. We keep going through the same character arc. They keep rebooting the same character arcs over and over again. Yeah, they'll change characters. They'll change situations. But the characters never seem to grow or learn from their past experiences. Here, we're seeing a lot of that. In fact, we're seeing Gwen Stacy seem to regress. She seems less confident now than she was in the first film. She's going through another cycle, which is good. It's good to see that because people do regress in life. Um, as it's good to see Miles progress in life. Uh, all, overall, I think this was a very well-made film, very well thought out. Um, there's going to be a third one, which is was also a surprise. Uh, the way they did that, I won't break it to people, but you know, there's going to be a third film. Uh, a very interesting idea there, um, which is something now is an iconic way of doing it. Um, and we also were given the continuation of the arc of Gwen Stacy, which is important because Gwen is the, the secondary to Miles. You know, if Miles is the primary uh, an, an, an analogous Spider-Man, then Gwen Stacy is the secondary analogous Spider-Man. And it's important that Gwen Stacy is that because she is very important to the Spider-Man mythos. The death of Gwen Stacy was actually the milestone or maybe tombstone, if I want to keep it right, real, to the end of the Silver Age. And uh, her character passed away at what people consider to be the, the beginning of the dark era of comics. Uh, afterwards, we had uh, the racial issues were brought in, drug issues were brought into comics oh, explicitly rather than implicitly. And Gwen Stacy's character was uh, a very sad moment because that character was never brought back. That was never a dream sequence. Uh, there was never an alternate uh, that was uh, alternate Gwen. Like that was not really Gwen. It was a robot, a dummy or whatever. No, they didn't do any of that. Stan refused to do that trick. Um, and I think part of the reason was, and I could be wrong here, I haven't done my research on this, but I believe at around that same time that uh, Stan and his wife lost a child. Um, I know they have one child that's still alive, but I think they lost one. And I think that he was projecting that grief into Peter Parker through losing Gwen Stacy, uh, his his girlfriend, his his the love of his life, really, even more so than Mary Jane. Uh, Gwen Stacy was that girl, you know, that that girl that was going to be the the girl, you know, and he lost her. And the idea that we've been given that character back this way um, really has turned another corner in comics history. And the idea that's in the animation is very, very. Uh, uh, how shall I say it? It, it? it gives me hope that this medium and when I say medium, I don't mean just the animation. I mean the, the the comic book character medium, the that mythos of comic characters across the board, not just Marvel, but DC and the rest of it. It has legs. You know, this this gives it legs because it's very well done and presented. And uh, I, I think that this really gives us um, a good template to build upon because I can easily see there being a Gwen Stacy film. I can easily see there being some of the other characters given their own uh, films as well or animations as well because it has that much weight to it now if we're going to deal with some of the cultural things which I think we have to um, I, I do know that uh, the Miles Morales character uh, being of mixed lineage actually because people don't understand that his father is uh, a, a descendant he's an American uh, black whereas his mother is, is Puerto Rican. There's a difference there. Um, and and I, I think the mix of that is, while while interesting and good, it was done in the comics that way, it, it still actually does leave out the indigenous black population. We still haven't been presented with that character. Uh, we had uh, the Black Panther, who was African. Uh, I, I guess maybe we're going to get Blade, who, who was African-American, but I don't know. And when I say African-American, I mean someone who was descended from uh, the the 
the descendant of the enslaved people in this country. Um, maybe Blade will be that. He was that in the comic, but we'll see what happens with that. I, I think that I really would like to see that character presented or character like that presented. And it would be interesting if Marvel ever gets around to that. But that's that's a little off point. Um, once again, uh, with this film, I did like the the innocence of the relationship between Miles and Gwen. They were being treated like two young people in love and there was no uh, underlying uh, sensuality there. It was just a friendship that may lead to something else. And I also like the idea that Gwen State, uh, uh, Spider Gwen brought up the idea that I've seen all the other altern alternate universes and the, the Gwen Stacy uh, Spider-Man thing, it, it never ends well. <laughs> Uh, once again we get back to the idea that uh, is there free will or is it predestination uh, predetermination uh, is, it a, is it a solid state universe or, do, or can we uh, or, or can we break it apart can we move in different directions and I like the idea that that's being brought up on multiple levels particularly the level of the, the tragedy of, of Uncle Ben or the tragedy of loss and also with the tragedy of love um that can be tragic as well and Gwen brought that up in the exchange they had on the uh, on top of the building um, once again well done and uh, I'm looking forward to the the um, sequel or treacle she call it so until next time <laughs>